Hey everybody, uh, we're taking a look at our second little chunk of the uh, 1920s. Um, a few guys requested that my dog be here, so uh, here he is. We're trying to get him to stay in the shop if we can. Uh, so we'll look at the next section of 1920s, looking at uh, women in the 20s, the mass culture of the 20s, prohibition, and the idea of fundamentalism. Uh, three really, really big topics uh, that were a big chunk of the 1920s. So let's start talking about women in the 20s. So what the way things were for women uh, prior to the 20s. So you remember that things are very, very strict, conservative by our terms. Uh, in the Victorian era, this time period between late 1800s and 1920s, you kind of see the clothing that was uh, in style here, pretty much covered, had to toe, that kind of stuff. Um, they did not believe in casual dating. You believe in what's called courting, uh, where you basically you would hang out with the person that you were planning on marrying uh, versus, you know, kind of play in the field and dating lots and lots of people. Um, Women were not supposed to be doing things like drinking and smoking in public. That was considered to be unladylike. So that was kind of the expectation of women as we go into the 1920s. And the 20s come and everything changes. Uh, first off, you have a lot of young ladies who take on this uh, persona that got become called the flapper. The idea of the flapper was invented in the book The Great Gas by F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, where it was uh, skirts that, oh my gosh, they came above the knee. Uh, they wore stockings that were rolled down to beneath the knee, as you kind of see this bottom picture right here, exposing actual skin. <gasps> they exposed bare shoulders. <gasps> oh my gosh, as well. And also cut their hair very short, what was called a bobbed haircut, which was a very, very short haircut that was supposed to come on late, like they wore makeup, that kind of stuff. And these are the flapper girls that also well did things like they dated many different guys. So they would go out with uh, different guys instead of just seeing one person. Uh, they would go out with, uh, you know, different guys on different nights and those kind of things. Um, they were seen at uh, at bars and speakeasies, drinking. They would smoke in public, that kind of stuff. It was a huge shock. Now, granted, not all women fulfilled this persona, but enough that it became a very popular kind of idea uh, in the 1920s. We also see kind of uh, shifts happen in terms of marriage as well. I was trying to say, before, uh, previous this marriage was seen as kind of a man being in charge, a uh, woman kind of being a, um, you know, kind of supporting the woman, that kind of stuff. And we kind of see the 20s make a change into marriage becoming more of a relationship versus a, you know, one person in charge, the other person uh, being kind of there. And so we kind of start seeing marriage shift to something that's a little more, a little more equal. Not totally equal, obviously, but more equal than it was uh, before the 1920s. The idea of a relationship was definitely more important than just being, you know, a guy taking care of a woman. Uh, Work-wise, okay, uh, women still work. Obviously, the World War One and the idea of women taking over uh, jobs, that kind of thing, would kind of start. We see a lot of clerical work become part of this, uh, part of, this, part of uh, the, the idea of work here. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, we also see more women going to college, more women becoming doctors and lawyers and those kind of things. Have professional jobs that prior to this were going to be considered only for men, and so that's a big chance change we see. Well, it's just something called the double standard. It's kind of where, uh, you know, the flapper girls come in. The idea of a double standard. Uh, in that, you know, think about this. There's always okay for guys to do all this kind of stuff. Guys to drink. Guys to date. Uh, guys to smoke in public. That kind of stuff. And when they did it, it was like, okay. It was like, ooh, I'm just being a man. That kind of thing. Whatever. But we were like, well, why is it not okay for us? If they were multiple guys, they were labeled as, you know, a... They were labeled as, you know, a harlot, if you will, a woman who was, you know, undesirable then because she was with all the different guys, that kind of stuff. If she was smoking and drinking, she was labeled as this bad girl. But then when guys did it, it was, oh, just being a guy, that kind of thing. And so this whole idea of double standard kind of comes around. People start questioning the idea of the double standard. Um, we even see voting here come be part of it. Uh, but in 1924, actually, there are two women governors in, in, in states, uh, in both Montana and Texas, by, by 1924 to 1925. There's a female governor, and so you see women being involved in politics, jobs. Uh, it kind of see the idea of clerical work, like you see here, okay? Um, you know, women that were typing, that kind of stuff. In fact, they even had classes in high school for women about typing and those kind of things. My grandmother did this kind of work in the late, very late 1930s um, in a, uh, at a place called CRI in Shano. She, when she read when she got out of high school, she read to be in, in a clerical job. It was kind of the, you know, job that I put aside for that. Even while you see these changes happening, Still, men are in the management position, um, and a lot of the industrial jobs as well. I think we looked at the Ford rate, the, the raises in, in Henry Ford's plants. Women were not part of those raises, so um, kind of example we see there. 
mass media wise. We start seeing a lot of uh, things change in the media as well. We start seeing what's called a syndicated paper. The idea that it's, uh, you know, the same paper, the same stories all the way across the country. Uh, and that happens for radio as well. Uh, you're also seeing something called the tabloids, okay? Here's an example of a tabloid where you kind of start seeing these sensational magazines, almost kind of like, almost like a trashy kind of magazine, if you will. Um, and like a supermarket magazine, I think it's Super Bowl there, but supermarket magazine, I have football in the brain, can't you tell? Uh, Super Bowl, Super uh, Market magazines where it's talking about, you know, these crazy things that happen all around the world, very sensational stories. Some are true, some not true, that kind of thing. We also start seeing the news, uh, displayed and portrayed for people. Um, there were things called newsreels that were played before movies. And so you, you would actually see newsreels being playing, actually seeing video of the news, obviously silent, because the most movies at the time were silent. Uh, but you, you would see, you know, these uh, silent movies that were uh, taking place uh, as well. And so you would see the news being broadcasted all the way across the country as part of that as well there. So you kind of see sensational stories here. Uh, Music-wise, a big, a big trend uh, in the... Twins is the idea of jazz music. Uh, jazz was born in New Orleans, uh, and it was really, really popular. It was improvisation. It was very upbeat, a different change from the classical music uh, that was very popular before that. It was kind of born out of the ragtime music of the turn of the century. Uh, you have a couple of really famous musicians, Duke Ellington and his orchestra, he's a piano player. Uh, you have Louis Armstrong, a very famous trumpet player. And the biggest idea here was that it was, it, it was improvisational, that the music was uh, unique every single time you heard it. I uh, also have the idea of blues. Uh, blues was a little different. It was um, kind of related to jazz, but it was born in the South, uh, where a lot of African Americans were talking about the difficulties that was happening down there. And there a lot of musicians who would play about uh, songs and sing songs about the difficulties they have growing up in the South, living in the South as sharecroppers, those kind of things. Um, you know, really famous uh, artist named Bessie Smith, she's a female vocalist, very, very famous at the time. You know, Robert Johnson, one of my favorite blues artists who uh, supposedly sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads down in Georgia, uh, or Mississippi, she, in Mississippi, um, to be able to play music and be famous that way, actually selling his soul. So all these real stories that come out of, of, of music at this time period. Even dancing, a big part of it. Um, dancing was a big part of the 20s. I'm playing a little video over here on the side. Uh, the big dance was something called the Charleston. Very, very kind of, you know, fast dance. I remember dance would dance together, did dance apart. Um, and it was, at the time, considered... You know, big social and go dance, enjoy yourselves. The older people that saw it thought this was the most immoral thing in the world. This is this here what you see in the film here is basically the modern, the would be you know the uh, 1920s equivalent to twerking, if you will. Um, and this made a lot of the people, the old people at the time, just freak out that these girls would be dancing by themselves and that uh, you would switch partners and those kind of things, and you were dancing so close and the way they were dancing, how fast they were dancing, and that kind of stuff. It was going to be extremely, extremely, extremely immoral uh, in terms of that. Usually this was at clubs, uh, beach alcohol, those kind of things, hence making it uh, this idea of being immoral, that kind of stuff. Um, we can stop that now. Okay. Uh, we have ra radio creating all these different heroes and sports heroes, that kind of stuff, because you hear uh, sports performances all over the place. Uh, baseball had guys like Babe Ruth and Rogers Hornsby, who were famous ball players, not just in their home cities, but also all over the world. Uh, football players like Jim Thorpe and Red Grange, same thing. You hear nationwide broadcasts of of, uh, of football games, boxing like Jack Dempsey and, hen and tennis and golf, that kind of thing. I even see it said women uh, athletes about Helen Wills was the most famous tennis player of the 20s, and especially uh, a young lady named Gertrude Elderly, uh, who actually swam across the English Channel. They actually kind of were broadcasting with her experience with English Channel live on the on the on the, uh, on the air. Question of prohibition for the two prohibition being. The idea to ban liquor in the U.S. And also the temperance movement, which happened early on in the 1800s. And a lot of different groups were involved in the idea of temperance movement. Uh, the women's group, religious groups, uh, even the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, were all about the idea of temperance. Uh, you have a couple of big groups like the Anti-Saloon League, who were against alcohol, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, some churches thought it was, a, it was a sin. So really this was popular before the passage of the, of the, of the Prohibition Amendment. Uh, there was also a lot of use of alcohol besides drinking. It was for infections and elixirs, relaxation, for cooking and industrial purposes as well. So prohibition was uh, made with the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So there's actually a constitutional amendment saying that it could be outlawed. And I think as many states actually outlawed alcohol long before uh, any kind of amendment or law got passed. Um, the amendment was enforced by an actual law called the Volstead Act that literally made it illegal to make or possess alcohol. Drinking it 
is actually not illegal, you just couldn't have it or make it or sell it or buy it. So obviously the idea of drinking it, not illegal, but everything else is a part of it. This whole law is supposed to be enforced by 1,000 federal officers and some local police. Let's just say it didn't work out so hot. A lot of groups, uh, the temperance groups, loved it, okay? But there's a big problem. Drinking was a cultural thing in some cultures. You know, during celebrations, daily life, the working class had a tradition of going from the factory to the bar to drink at the, after, after a hard day's work. A lot of protests, and a lot of people decided to just keep drinking anyway. The biggest failure was the idea of bootlegging during Prohibition. Uh, people started drinking these things called speakeasies, you should picture that in a second, which are legal bars all around the, around the country. And so either people started making their own booze called moonshine because they made it by the light of the moon. And sometimes moonshine was full of nasty chemicals that could cause you to go blind or even kill you. Uh, other people were imported, illegal imported uh, alcohol from like Canada or Cuba or Mexico. They used boats with big engines on them to get it across the, the Gulf of Mexico. They used cars to get it across the, uh, the border. In fact, uh, even up by Detroit, they would actually use snowmobiles to get it across the Canadian border into Michigan and Wisconsin, those kind of things. So you even have these guys down south who had run from the police. It's basically the origins of NASCAR. It's kind of cool. Speakeasy were these underground clubs. We had to have a secret password. Like you see this guy here. You know, tell a password, you get in. Men and women were all together, drinking, having fun, listening to music, that kind of stuff. Jazz music, drinking alcohol. And that can be a secret defense system that they could use to get raided by the police. In fact, there was one bar that had a special lever you pulled. If the cops came, all the shelves with all the alcohol on it would collapse. And all the alcohol would, would drop right down into the sewer, and you wouldn't get busted that way. So people would go and drink in these little speakeasies, that kind of stuff. We also see the idea of organized crime. Um, violence happened in a lot of countries, Chicago, L.A., uh, New York, etc. And different crime groups got together. They do things like racketeering. Like they would basically make you promise to pay them in order for them to protect you. A lot of times you're just being protecting from them, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, they were basically paying protection money. So, you know, people would walk in and, you know, say, hey, pay us or something bad's going to happen. Well, if you didn't pay them, then they were going to bust up your store, that kind of thing. Other crimes, gambling, pot, prostitution were also big things, organized crime. So the biggest money was in alcohol. And gangsters started up the alcohol business. They breweries. They stole alcohol from Canada. They made sure they extorted different speakeasies to only serve their booze, that kind of stuff. And gangsters made hundreds of millions of dollars in the alcohol business. And the biggest place, was obviously, was in Chicago. In Charlotte, there's two sides. There's North Side Gang, which is the Irish Gang, and a South Side Gang, which are the Italian Gang. So Al Capone, probably the most famous guy, is uh, was a South Side Gang. And uh, up up north, there was a guy named uh, Diano Banyan, who was one of the most famous Irish gangers, gangs that are out there. You a picture of uh, his Capone's mugshot. And basically, we had a five-year-long gang war over alcohol. In fact, these gangsters were liked. I mean, uh, Al Capone gave money a charity. He ran a soup kitchen and a homeless shelter for the poor. A lot of times they had these companies that they would use to, like, as a front for the legal business to hide all the money they were pulling in, that kind of stuff. Criminals also used new technology. They used new cars, better cars, big V8 engines uh, to do their crime. They also had automatic weapons like the Tommy gun, Thompson submachine gun, uh, that could fire 500 bullets a minute. And they would use these cars to do drive-bys and that kind of stuff. They used bombs and grenades, all stuff by World War One to kill each other. But they're not no one killing each other in battlefields of Europe. They're tr shooting at each other in, New in uh, Chicago, New York, and big places like that. Uh, the big one event in the gangland history is the idea of something called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Basically, the biggest day, gang of, day of gang violence in Chicago. What happened was uh, Capone wanted, wanted uh, uh, revenge against this uh, gang led by a guy named Bugs Moran. And basically made a setup. He made a fake liquor buy uh, for the Moran gang. And Moran was come there and pay the money, pay the bill himself. These guys from ranking are in this garage in Chicago, and all of a sudden these guys come wearing police officer uniforms. And as these guys turn around, put their hands up, the police can pull out Thompson submachine guns and pump these guys full of lead. And it leads to the picture you see down here at the bottom where seven guys get killed. Moran himself was just down the block, heard the machine guns, and ran the other direction. When the public starts seeing this stuff, the public starts getting worried and starts to go against the gangsters. And we actually have government men, the FBI, who comes into and starts trying to stop organized crime. To stop Capone at three of the big events. You have Elliot Ness, who's in charge of catching Capone and his group called the Untouchables, registered for the IRS. And eventually they arrested Capone on tax evasion charges, and Capone later dies uh, in prison. So eventually we see prohibition fail because of bootlegging, all the organized crime, and the other drugs like, mar like marijuana that kind of stuff became, uh, you know, a big drug. And by 1925, we start seeing the, the uh, 
uh, the prohibition start to lose a little bit of steam. 